so for those of you who weren't here or, or like me and just don't have the best memory, uh, here's a little bit of a review of what we talked about uh, last week. Uh, you know, we talked about, we we're going through the book of 1 John. Right now, 1 John is written uh, for the believer in Christ. This is a book that is titled To Believers. And one of the reasons why we're reading through this uh, is to recall the basics of the Christian faith. That's one of the things that 1 John does. It shows you what it's like uh, to be a Christian, how you're supposed to live. Uh, is your faith genuine? In other words, are you walking in the light? We talked about that phrase last week, walking in the light. To walk really just means to conduct yourself, right? To walk is your actions, your deeds, your thoughts, your speech, your desires. In other words, your life, your heart. Where is it directed at? Where are you walking? If we're a believer, we're told we're going to walk in the light. We talked about what the light is. We find that in 1 John. Uh, and if you have your Bibles, flip over to 1 John. That's where we're going to spend a uh, majority of the time today is in 1 John. But in 1 John 1, 5, uh, this is what it says. It says, This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So that simply answers the question, what is the light? Well, Scripture tells us the light is God, and in God there's no darkness, right? So what is darkness? Well, darkness is sin, right? It's the absence of God. It's evil, it's corruption, it's wickedness, and it's not based on our standards, but on God's standards that we find through the Holy Scripture. That's what sin is. That's what darkness is. Now, everyone, we learned, is going to walk one of two ways. You're either going to walk in the light with God, or you're going to walk in darkness in sin, right? You can't have both. We know that because the Scripture just told us that in Him, there is no darkness at all. You can't be in the light and still... Uh, be in, in your sin. So everyone will choose to will either walk in the darkness or the light, never in both. Uh, so the reason we study this book on Sundays from the pulpit, uh, I, I'm listing off three reasons here that I think is important to uh, go over what we're going over. And here's point number one, so that we are not deceived by false doctrines or by false teachers. We talked about in Matthew uh, 7 how uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I uh, prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? In your name perform many miracles. I'm going to say, depart from me. You who practice evil, I never knew you. Right? It says many will say that. These people are going to claim God is Lord. They're going to claim, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things? Lord, I did everything for you. Right? I did all these things, Lord. But God's going to say, no, you know, I never knew you. There was never that relationship you never had that relationship with me. These people are going to be deceived, and we don't want to fall into that same category. These people believed in a false gospel, which is why we want to know the true gospel. Um, number two is to identify those who are deceived, those who are lost. Because if we can see who are lost and who are deceived, who are walking in darkness, us who are in the light should go alongside them and evangelize to them, right? Preach the gospel to them. Teach them this, the saving truth that we find in Christ our Lord. That's our job as believers. Find the lost and share with them the good news that Christ came and paid our debt of sin up on the cross. Here's a third point. is to be encouraged through genuine belief. Right? If, you're, you know, if you go through these points that we've been talking about and you find other points in the scripture... Right, that kind of show that you were saved and you're going and you're saying, yeah, I am doing all these things. And when I fail, I repent and I get back on track and I'm doing these things. Uh, and I feel guilt with my sins and I, I repent and I change uh, the way that I'm walking. You know, all these things, it encourages you that your faith is genuine. So next time Satan comes knocking at your door, you'll be able to stand firm and know that you are truly God's. So... To finish off our review from last week, three points we learned last week, three ways to know if we are in the light. Here's the first way that we uh, enjoy and prefer Christ-centered fellowship with other believers, right? We have a commonness with other believers, and we're able to fellowship, and that is through the commonness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we enjoy and prefer that fellowship over fellowship with the unbelieving or those who are in the world. 
Uh, number two, the second point we learned last week is that, you know, we are in the light. If we view our sin the same way God views them, this doesn't mean just to acknowledge and admit that you're a sinner, right? It's more than just saying, I have hiccups, you know, I, I mess up sometimes, but who doesn't, you know, not that big a deal. My sin's not as bad as so-and-so sin. That's not viewing your sin the same way that God views your sin. God views our sin as evil, corrupt, offensive, and he hates it. God hates our sin. Are we viewing our sin the same way? Do we hate our sin or have we gotten comfortable in our sin? Here's a third point we learned last week. We're in the light if we strive to know and keep God's word, right? We want to keep God's word. We want to obey God's word, not because we believe that's going, uh, you know, through uh, works and stuff that we're going to have salvation, but we love God. We want to know God's word. We want to we want to fellowship with God. We want to be in the light. We want to keep God's word. So today we're going to finish off our two-week study uh, with four more uh, points of how to tell if you are in the light. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity to come and worship you through the reading of your word, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that as we go through this, you give me uh, the right words to say, Lord, and that you open up ears and hearts, Lord, and that you will save, Lord, as you do. God, we just uh, come before you and give you all the glory and all the praise and all the thanks for what you do for us, Lord. God, just continue to work in our lives and allow us to demonstrate that we are yours, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our first point, if you have your Bibles open, First John, we're going to start in chapter 2. Uh, starting at verse 15, going through 17, point number four, here it is. It says, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The world is passing away. And also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So our fourth point in our seven point series is this. If we are in the light, we will not desire or love the things of the world. We will not love the world. Now, I know you guys might be thinking, well, Pastor Joe, the most popular verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, Right. So what's the difference? God loves the world. We want to be like God. How come First John here, John's telling us don't love the world? Well, it's different. In John 3.16, when it talks about God so loved the world, it doesn't mean that God looks at the world and approves of the wickedness and the sinfulness that is in the world, right? God doesn't look at the world, see that, and says, you know, I love that wickedness. That's not who God is, right? God doesn't approve of the world in that sense, but here's what it means. God looks at the world. He sees that mankind has sinned against him, that we have a debt that we cannot pay, and we are in desperate need of a Savior, and we are hopeless and helpless on our own. But God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to leave heaven, come down to earth, 100% God, 100% man, live a sinless and perfect life while facing the same kind of temptations and trials and pain that we face here. And yet he did it perfectly so that he would be the spotless lamb on the cross to bear our sins. Why did God do that? Because he so loved us. That's what it means in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. But what does it mean here in 1 John 2, do not love the world, right? 1 John's not talking about, you know, that gospel, that sense that, you know, don't love humanity, don't love mankind, don't love creation. But what he's saying is do not love the world's ideas, their morals, their ideology, their spiritual system, what they tolerate, what they believe is right, what they believe is true. Do not believe that. Why? What is so wrong with how the world views things? Second Peter uh, 1 tells us, says this, For by these things he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. The world is corrupt. And if we love the world, we love the corruptness that is in the world that goes against everything God says in His Holy Scripture. 
Can we be friends of the world and still friends of God? Well, you know, I, I kind of like my sin, but I also love God. I'm kind of friends with both, right? I'm friends with the world. Uh, here's what James 4, 4 says about it. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's real simple. If you are friends of the world, you love this world, you like what the world's ideas, the things that they teach and the things that the world preaches, you love the world, you're an enemy of God. That is not my words. That's God's words through a scripture. If you claim to love the world, you're claiming to be an enemy of God. Now, what's going to happen to the world? What's going to happen to those who follow these you know, ideas of the world? John 12, 31 tells us, says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Judgment is coming to the world. The ruler is going to be cast out of the world. And those who follow what this ruler says, well, who is this ruler? If this is your first time in church, you're going to be shocked. Right? The ruler is not the president of the United States. The ruler is not the leader of the United Nations. The ruler isn't any political uh, figure right now, right? The, the one who's in charge of the, you know, the, the best uh, country. That's not who the ruler of this world is. The ruler of this world is Satan. Here's how we know. This is from Luke 4. This is when Jesus goes to be tempted by Satan. Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the earth, right? Trying to get him to uh, join his rebellion against God. Here's what Satan says. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it had been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Now Jesus answered Satan and said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan offered the, all the kingdoms of the world to Christ. How was he able to do this? Because he's the temporary ruler of this world. That's how he was able to do it. That's a genuine offer, right? That was a genuine offer that Satan gave to Christ. But now that does not mean, right, don't be afraid. That doesn't mean that Satan has power over God. Satan has nothing on God. Satan has nothing on Christ, right? As a matter of fact, if you ever read through the book of Job, we see this unique thing where uh, Satan, he, you know, he goes before God and God says, what have you been up to? And Satan has to answer to God. He has to tell God what he's been doing. God is still sovereign over all, right? Satan's rule of this world is temporary, and God is allowing Satan to rule this world to reveal the true wickedness of man's heart. Now, his, Satan's uh, rule is temporary. We know that from Revelation 20. We see that when Christ comes and establishes his thousand-year reign, Satan is locked up later to be released afterwards and be cast into the lake of fire along with those who love the world and who walk in darkness and who love these ideas of what the world and Satan has to offer. Satan does not win. And we know that because it's prophesied. And if you know anything about Bible prophecy, that's as sure as taxes, right? You can take that to the bank. It's going to happen if it's prophesied in the Bible. Satan does not win. Now, he gets tossed into the lake of fire with the world. Now, the ideas, the morals, the spiritual systems of the world, what are they? I believe we can find those whenever we see the desires and the deeds of the flesh. I believe uh, the desires and deeds and the morals of the flesh describe what the world is today. And we find that in Galatians 5, uh, starting at 19, going through 21. So now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, uh, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right, there's that huge list that kind of tells you what it's like apart from God, what it's like, what the world's ideas are. Immorality, what does that consist of? 
that consists of adultery, premarital sex, pornography, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, prostitution. And when we look at the world that we live in today, they glorify this stuff. I never thought we would live in a world where prostitution is looked at as an honor. But here we are, living in that world. It's wicked. Next thing, sorcery. What does that consist of? That consists of witchcraft, magic, mind-altering drugs, special powers, or different abilities. The world accepts these things, and they strive to gain these things. A lot of people claim they can talk to the, to the dead, those who have died. You know, I have this special ability, this power. I can speak to your loved ones for a small fee of nineteen ninety nine. I will tell you what they, you know, tell me to tell you. Right? We laugh, but that is what this world is coming to. It's in our youth. Our youth believe you know, they, that they are developing these things because they see it on social media. They see it on the internet. They see it in their schools. Everybody wants to have these special powers. Right? That's sorcery. The other things that are listed, the behavior sins, uh, outbursts of anger, violence, drunkenness, jealousy, pride, These things the world encourages. If you don't like something, just go riot, right? Get your voice out there. We see that in our world today. The world does not know God, and it is passing away, according to Scripture, along with those who love the world and love the things of the world. So that's point four, do not love the world. Now, moving on to point five here. It's also found in 1 John uh, 2.23. It says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So we are of the light. This is point five. We are of the light if we know that the only way to the Father is through Jesus, Jesus Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. It's that simple. There's no other way, right? That should be that simple. But however, many false teachers claim that there are many ways to heaven. There's many ways to paradise. There are many ways to God. They lead people astray to the point where a survey was done and I think somewhere around 50% of uh, church attenders claim that there's multiple religions that can lead to eternal life. How how do people get that so lost? Because those people who have claimed this, they're the once a week attenders. They come to church on Sunday, sit in the pew, go home and they want nothing to do with God until the next Sunday, right? They don't read the scripture. They don't know true doctrine. It's important to know what God is teaching, right? It's important to know that. And I believe these people who don't know what God says believe anything that a celebrity would tell them, right? There's, a, there's this guy who claims to be a Christian. Some of you guys might know him as a Steve Harvey. Uh, he has been on record and said, He believes earning uh, heaven. There's many ways to heaven. It's kind of like watching TV, right? There's thousands of channels. You pick one, you watch it, you're pretty entertained. You know, someone down the street, they may be watching another channel, yet they're still getting entertained, right? He says that's the way that it is to heaven. There's many paths. Just because someone's not on your path doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. Just because someone's a different religion than you are doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. And we know this is completely false. People believe that you can pray your way to heaven, you can work your way to heaven, or you can pay your way to heaven. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want your money. God's not going to look at you and say, let me look at your tithing. Uh, Here, come in. No, that's not what he's going to do. In fact, there's only one way to heaven. We find that in John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Do you guys catch that? Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and he is the life. Not a way, not a truth, not a life. He is the only way. Accepting Christ as our Savior and submitting our life to him is the only way that we can see the Father. We can make it to heaven. That's the only way. So if you have to do this, before you die, before it's too late. Now, in Luke 16, we see a parable, and this is kind of an interesting parable. Uh, This is the only parable that Jesus gives a name to one of the people in it, right? Lazarus. It's not the Lazarus he raised from the dead, but 
he names one of the characters in here, Lazarus, which some people believe this is a real occurrence because of that, right? But anyway, we can find a couple things out by reading this. So follow along. It says, uh, now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in, in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. So just by reading this, we get this picture. We see that there is an afterlife, right? There is an afterlife after we, we die, and it is eternal, but it's either eternal in heaven or eternal in hell, right? That's where we're going to end up. And what we also see is that once you go, it's too late to change your mind. It's too late to cross over to the other side. It's too late, right? This should fear the unbeliever. However, this should motivate the believer to go out and evangelize, to go out and reach the lost before it's too late. Our days are numbered. Our days are numbered and nothing, there's nothing we can do to add a single minute to our life or take away a single minute of our life. Christ knows when we're going. Uh, we know we're going to die. And we know that there's eternal life after uh, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's eternal suffering apart from Jesus. So when it's time to go, you got to make sure you know the Savior. Some people say, I'm just going to do it on my deathbed. You might leave here today and not make it home. You might not get a deathbed. It's time that you make that conscious decision to accept Christ as your Savior. So that was point five. Moving on to point six, uh, it's found in 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 2, going through 3. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So point number six, if you are in the light, a true child of God, we will be looking forward to the day that we get to meet our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking forward to that day that there's no more pain, no more suffering. We should be looking forward to that. And here we are in the church age, we believe the next thing to occur is the rapture, the rapture of the church, where we'll be caught up in the air with other believers, right? We should be looking forward to that day. We should be longing for that day, right? We need to be looking forward to the rapture of the church because our hope is found in Christ and being made pure as he is pure. Now, I want to kind of give an example here. Paul, he was in prison when he was writing to the church of uh, Philippi, and here's what it says in Philippians 1, 21, it says this, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul here doesn't know, am I facing you know, release or am I facing death? But Paul finds himself in a win-win situation. He says, man, if God decides to take me right now, that's the best case scenario for me. But you know what? If he doesn't decide to take me, I'm going to stay here and I'm gonna, there's fruitful labor for me to do. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to... Uh, help people grow closer to God, right? For Paul, or for God to call Paul would mean eternal fellowship with his creator in peace, in comfort. There's no more pain, no more tears, no more sickness. As a believer, that should be our hope. 
We should look forward to that day as a believer. But if we're living, there needs to be the fruitful labor. We need to be sharing the gospel with others. Right? We need to be doing that. To be in heaven is much better than to live on in prison. And Paul has a genuine desire to be with the Father. This is why I say a true believer would desire to be with the Father. And while we await our time, we continue to labor for Christ. Not because we think that our labor is going to earn us favor and gain us salvation, but because God in His great mercy has saved us and we labor because of that. We labor for Him, right? Not because it's going to make us any better, not because it's going to earn us any salvation, but because we love Him. We choose to serve Him because of what, how He demonstrated His love for us. So the last point, um, it's found in 1 John chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 9. It says, No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. This is a highly debated verse here, you know, uh, because some versions say, you know, if you are in the light, you will not sin. Some versions say that. Some other versions say you will not practice sin. You talk to, you know, different people, they might say, yeah, you can fall away as a believer. And other people say, no, you can't fall away as a believer. So what does this mean? Does this mean that if we are baptized by the Spirit and walked in the blood, you know, and we sin after that, if we go home and someone cuts us off in traffic after we profess true faith in Christ and we let our anger get the best of us and we say a word that we're not supposed to say, does that mean our faith was never genuine? No, that's not what that means. What does this mean? That since we are saved by the grace of God, He no longer cares when we sin? He says, ah, oh, you're saved. Go ahead, do what you want. My son already paid the price for you, right? That's not what He means. Right? Does this mean that since we are in the light that God no longer knows when we sin? No, that's not what that means. God is all-knowing. He knows when we sin. We see that through the Bible. Uh, people who profess faith in Christ and then later on sinned, right? God knows that. He understands that. But here's what it means. It means that, that we are washed by the blood. We are in the light. We are saved. We are a child of God. If that is us, we no longer indulge in our sin. We no longer go out looking for a reason to sin. We no longer are a slave to sin. We have been set free. However, when we do sin, and if you are a true believer, you have an advocate with the Father, that's Christ. That's 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So can believers live in sin? Can believers fall so far away that they live in sin, right? You talk to one guy, they say yes. You talk to the next guy, they say no. But I like what this commentator uh, said. He made a comparison here to the prodigal son. I mean, you guys know the story of the prodigal son. He pretty much tells his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead so I can have what was mine, so I can go off and live the way that I want to do. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to be in your presence anymore, Father. I'm going to go off and do what I want to do. The, the father allowed him to, and he squandered his uh, money away and, uh, you know, was with the pigs. And here's what the commentator says. He says the son could not stay in that pig pen because that's not where he belonged. He wasn't a pig. He didn't belong there, but he was the father's, which is why he went back. A child of God would always want to be with the father and in his holy presence. A true believer would desire this over practicing their sin. A true believer would want to be with the Father and around his people rather than get caught up in his hate or his greed or pornography or pride or anger or abandoning their family or jealousy or lying or addictions. If you are a true believer in God, you're going to want to be in the presence of God. You're not going to want to walk away. But when you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. A true believer will always feel conviction from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's here for a reason, 
to bring forth conviction in true believers. We will always feel convicted from the Spirit. Uh, a believer in Christ will always repent from their sin. And a true believer may still sin, but he is no longer a slave to sin. It's not who he is anymore. And if you have accepted the free gift of the cross, when God sees you, he looks at you and he sees a son. He sees that your debt has been paid. The believer has been set free, and that is a gift we can never lose. We can never lose our salvation. And I say this because Romans 8, starting in verse 35, going all the way to 39. And I find this real encouraging. I think this is one of the most encouraging passages in the Bible for a believer. It says this, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress uh, or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. For are we, we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can anything take us out of the Father's love if we are His? Nothing. Nothing can take us out of that. That's encouraging. There is not one sin that God cannot save you from. If you struggle with homosexuality, God will save you from that. If you struggle with uh, lying... God will save you from that. If you struggle with drunkenness, God will save you from that. If you struggle with addictions, God will save you from that. If you struggle uh, with, with lying and hating and all those sins, you fill in the blank of the sin that you struggle with, God is the one who will save you from that. God rescues the sinner. And God chose to save us because he loves us. The struggle with the sinner or with the believer in sin it's a real struggle. We see that when Paul in Romans 7, we talked about last week, he's struggling with the sins of the flesh and the, des and the desire of his heart. Uh, and Paul ends it and says, I am a wretched man. Who will save me? God. God is the one who will save you. And God is the only one who can save you. It's kind of interesting because what does God save you from? From God. God is the only one who can save you from the wrath of God that is to come amongst the sinners. Right? God saves you from God. Right? But those are the seven points. So as a way of a recap here, uh, in order to have fellowship with God, we must walk in the light. Right? Our conduct it has to be towards God. Our thoughts, our desires, our actions, uh, our deeds has to be towards the light. And we know that we are in the light if we demonstrate all of these points that we talked about. And even the points that we didn't talk about, like, you know, loving uh, your fellow believer, any other points you can find in the scripture, you know, standing up for the true gospel, all those other ways that you can demonstrate that you have a true, genuine salvation. It's not a matter of keeping a majority of them. It's a matter of keeping all of them. Here's the seven points that we learned, though, in the last two weeks. Point number one, uh, you are of the light if you enjoy and prefer fellowship with other believers. Remember, there's a commonness that you share. That commonness is Christ. He is the center of our fellowship, and we desire that fellowship. Point number two, we are of the light if we view our sin the same way God does. Not just acknowledge your sin, not just admit that you're a sinner, but to hate your sin. Hate your sin so much that it draws you to repentance. Number three is that we strive to know and keep God's word, right? If we are of the light, we're going to want to know God's word and keep God's word. And when we fail, we, we repent. Number four is uh, we know we're of the light if we do not love the ideas and of the world and where the world is. We don't love that. We're apart from the world. The world is dark. It's corrupt. It's wicked according to the scripture of God. Point number five is that we confess that Christ is the only hope that we have. The only hope that we have. He is the only path to heaven. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Point number six is that we look forward to being with Christ 
if we are a true believer, we look forward to the day that Christ takes us home. You know, we're the bride of church. He goes to prepare a place for us. He's coming back for us. And that's exciting. We need to look forward to that and allow that to encourage us to share the gospel with those who don't know. And the last point is that we do not live in our sin. We do not practice our sin. We do not desire our sin over fellowship with God, over being in the presence of the Father. However, if you are living in your life of sin and you are truly His, you will repent. You will come back. That's why we practice uh, church discipline. We give them over for the destruction to Satan, for the destruction of their flesh, so that way if they are a true believer, they come back and we rejoice. We welcome Him back, right? As a true believer, you will not live in sin. Uh, if you demonstrate these points and have made a genuine heart change for Christ, you are of the light. However, if you have not, you are in the darkness, but that's not the end of the story. The Lord is merciful, and there is not one sin that he cannot and will not forgive. And if you would just come to him with a broken and repented heart, confess your faith in him, confess who you are apart from him, if you just come to him, come to his son on the cross, accept that free gift God offers you, you will see how merciful he is. Amen? Well, as the music team comes up, uh, as we transfer into a time of communion, let's uh, pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you, Lord, that you've given us your holy scripture. God, that we can trust in you and that you have provided this opportunity for us to gather together and to worship you, Lord. I just pray that our worship doesn't stop here today, Lord, that we go home and we worship you throughout the week. We read your scripture throughout the week. We pray to you uh, all the time, Lord, for you are good, God. You are merciful. I pray that if there's someone here, Lord, who does not know you, that they will uh, have that desire to come to you, that you would save them, Lord, because you are the God who saves God. Lord, just thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your grace. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.